The Lord be with you and also with you. Good morning and welcome to La Mesa Presbyterian Church. My name is Lois Meyer. We invite you to join us for our Sunday classes. We have a Bible study group that meets here at the church in the library. And we also have a going deeper session that meets at 9 a.m. that you can also register for by Zoom if you prefer that. And Holy Happy Hour at 7 p.m. on Sundays via Zoom. <clears throat> you register for that also on the church website. Remember, you can keep up with any events and RSVP and make donations through our church website. Re uh, the Reverend Judy Wellington is on vacation until next Tuesday, and we're pleased to welcome our guest preacher today, who will be Reverend Susan Quaz. Thank you for being with us. The call to worship. We have come to worship God, the living God, who calls prophets and teachers to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the almighty God, who answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of grace. We have come to worship God, the all gracious God, who chooses even you and me to receive and carry the word of life and hope. All glory to God. Church. My name is the Reverend Susan Quas, and I am a teaching elder or minister member of the Presbytery of Santa Fe at large, and I'm delighted to be welcomed here to this pulpit. I uh, appreciated Judy calling and asking me to come and be with you today. The reputation of this congregation is a strong one in the Presbytery, and it's my delight to be with you. I also want to bring you greetings from Laguna United Presbyterian Church. I'm one of the elders who share preaching responsibilities there. 
Your sisters and brothers at Laguna Pueblo are experiencing severe degrees of COVID infection. The whole Pueblo is experiencing this. And several church family members have died. And given the recent upsurge in COVID cases, the session at Laguna has suspended in-person worship, and I ask you please to keep them in your prayers. I'm also related to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church by marriage. My husband, Roger Powers, is there as their pastor. Two years ago, following the General Assembly's uh, repudiation of the Doctrine of Discovery, St. Andrew took a step to repudiate it themselves, the session. And they have begun to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of their worship, and I want to share that with you today. This is how it goes. As we enter worship, we give thanks for God's creation. We remember that the earth is sacred and that we are gathered on holy ground. We are gathered on land that has been the home of indigenous peoples for many generations, long before European settlers came to this place. And we ask for God's blessing upon this land, upon all who have walked upon it in the past and all who continue to walk upon it today. This is the land acknowledgement that is offered at St. Andrew every Sunday. Friends, our God is gracious, slow to anger and quick to forgive. With confidence, let us pray the prayer of confession together. Gracious God, you have commissioned us to make our common home a place of justice for all. In your generous love, you send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And in Jesus, you teach us to love without discrimination. We confess that we have failed to follow this teaching by disrespecting our neighbors, spreading falsehoods, participating in the disruption of social harmony, and making the world a barren field that no longer brings forth your justice for all creation. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and lead us to new life for ourselves and all beings. Amen. Jesus has opened the doors for service to each one of us. We have been freed from our sin and fear. Rejoice, dear friends. In Jesus' name, we are forgiven. We are set free for justice and love. Amen. And now a prayer of illumination before we hear the scriptures. Blessed Jesus, at your word, we have come again to hear you. Let our thoughts and hearts be stirred and in glowing faith be near you. By your gospel, true and holy, teach us, Lord, to love you solely. Our first reading is from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them, saying, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, 
who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends the uh, first reading. The Gospel of our Lord according to Luke chapter 4 beginning with the 14th verse. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding countryside. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I'm one of several who went uh, three years ago to Winter Talk in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the sixth annual Winter Talk put on by the Disciples of Christ. Those of us who went from the New Mexico included nine Presbyterians, and I was among them. I myself am a European-American, daughter of English colonists who stole native lands of the Monacan Nation and enslaved Africans to increase their own wealth on the East Coast, and daughter of German immigrants who participated in the Midwestern land rush to steal lands from the Missouri Sioux for farming. And currently, I live on the stolen lands of the Pueblo ancestors. And I am bringing you today a message that relies heavily on what I learned at the sixth annual Winter Talk in 2019 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, offered by the Disciples of Christ. Winter Talk is a three-day conversation on the Christian doctrine of discovery and its influence on the church, on the world, and on relations between Europeans and indigenous peoples. On the first morning, 40 people gathered in a circle at Phillips Seminary in Tulsa. Winter Talk was opened by Blue Eagle, an elder of the Chickasaw Nation and an ordained minister of the Disciples of Christ. He acknowledged the four directions. He lighted four candles and offered sage. And we were invited to bring an item of significance from our own home, our own land, our own people, to place in the worship center. I brought, in my ignorance, not something from my own people, but a liturgical stole with a Zia symbol on it. I named the significance of the Zia symbol, as best as I knew it, the circle of life, the sacred number four, the four directions, the four times of day, and the four stages of life, the four seasons. Throughout our three days together, the leaders were Native peoples. Reverend Shaban Colonel, a Seminole Muskegee elder from Moore, Oklahoma, was the keynote speaker. 
He is Executive Secretary of Native American and Indigenous Ministries for the United Methodist Church. Reverend Colonel spoke passionately and powerfully of the strength of Native peoples and Native ways. He reminded us over and over again that Native peoples inhabited the Americas 13,000 and more years ago. So events like First Contact and U.S. independence only 250 years ago are a very small part of their history. Reverend, Reverend Cornell shared the values he learned as Muskegee and that center on humility and love. He said, I do not put myself above others. I do not subject others to my ways. I was taught to live simply, to be able to gather up all my belongings under one arm when my people need to move. And my people settled disputes among peoples with games, invented to replace war. No need for guns or weapons of mass destruction. Reverend Colonel modeled for us deep mutual respect for all who were gathered and he reminded us that in Native American culture, women are held in high esteem and leadership, regardless of how non-Natives see them. And Reverend Cornell spoke of the genocidal events following first contact <laughs> between Europeans and Native Americans. How the colonial powers, conquistadors, mercenaries, colonists, settlers, and later the immigrants all stole land and sought to convert, enslave, and eradicate native peoples. He spoke of the many ways Catholic, that's Catholic with a small c, meaning the global church, our church, the Christian church, Christian European church and nations, and later the US government and US Christian denominations denied the humanity of Native peoples. We also learned that Europeans in the colonial era found some Native ways to be of great value. When the revolutionaries in the 13 European colonies sought to create an alliance of states from Vermont down to Georgia, they modeled their union on what they had learned of the Iroquois Confederacy. The colonists actually wrote a constitution using that as a model to unite the separate states. Yet, the colonists left out significant practices that were key to the peace, prosperity, and stability of the Iroquois Confederacy. The constitution left out the significant role of women, and the radical connection with and reverence for the land and all creation. This was a lot to take in, the bad and the good. And let's pause here a minute and take a breath. We will return to this in a moment, but come with me and let's learn from the scripture to see what today's text has to offer us. So take a breath. Let it out. And we turn to the book of Acts, a reflection of the early church that set in a time when Israel is under Roman occupation and Christ's followers are just a small sect within Judaism. The text we read today from Acts records a striking moment in the life of the early church. You see, until this point, the followers of Jesus had all been Jews. It was assumed you had to be a Jew to be a follower of Jesus. But something was happening. The disciples had begun to witness the Holy Spirit at work in Gentiles, heathens. What did that mean for the church? What did it mean? So in a very Presbyterian fashion, the leaders called a meeting of the church. 
to decide the question. And we read in Acts, Then Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? God shows no partiality. The early church looked at what was taking place all around them. They saw that the followers of Jesus were not the only ones living out Jesus' message. To love your neighbor, to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to free the oppressed, to work for the common good of all. And the early church had enough humility, as Reverend Cornell would say, to admit God's blessing had been bestowed on others, not of their sect. God shows no partiality, neither should we as the church. This is what they decided. Without this confession, without this humility, this wisdom, Christianity would have remained a very small sect of Judaism. Instead, the Christian message spread across the globe, welcoming all followers of the way of Jesus. Humility. Humility and showing no partiality were key to the early church. Showing no partiality was the good news. No partiality in social standing, in ethnic lineage, in language, in religious heritage. That was the early church. But a few hundred years later, this commitment to impartiality began to fade. The church, you see, married empire, was seduced in the fourth century and aligned itself with Rome, and partiality came into favor. Peter's words were neglected and then over the years ignored. Over a thousand years later, being married to empire, the church's values were cemented to partiality, hierarchy, dominance, and wealth. The church, our church, was at the top of the hierarchy, spanning nations across Europe and the Mediterranean, and had the power, and gave itself the power, at the top, to name good and evil, the power to choose who is chosen and who is heathen, the power to name reality in a way that furthers the church's own dominance and wealth. By 1400, new worlds were being explored. European Christian nations were sailing south and landing on the west coast of Africa. And there was a dispute brewing in Christendom a dispute between Spain and Portugal about these new lands and their inhabitants. And the church needed to maintain its integrity and its, its dominance. It needed to prevent Christian nations from fighting one another. So it declared, it set out a law it issued a statement, it gave an order, it gave a papal bull, which is what it was called at the time, called the Doctrine of Discovery. The short version is the Doctrine of Discovery says, when a Christian European nation lands on foreign soil, plants the flag, it has the divine right to claim the land and all its resources for God and country and also to subdue, convert, enslave, or kill all the inhabitants. That's what it said. It was a step to maintain power and dominance. It prevented Christian nations from infighting and ensured that the church got a major share of economic spoils from these new dominions. 
It was a way of maintaining Christian supremacy. And it led to these particular impacts of the doctrine of discovery. The accumulation of wealth and power in European nations and the church. The enslavement of African peoples. The near annihilation of 100 million indigenous peoples on two continents. The theft of lands in both extractive colonization and settler colonization on three continents. North America, South America, and Africa, for those who are counting, and in programs to enslave, impoverish, educate, and annihilate, if not assimilate, native peoples into extinction. So much for God being impartial and the church being that too. It wasn't happening. The church was wedded to empire. During the winter talk, Reverend David Bell, who is a minister for indigenous people concerns of the disciples of Christ, challenged us to examine the language the church used, used in the past and uses now to name its action, doctrine of discovery. He reminded us that the reality is not captured in the term doctrine of discovery or the term first encounter those terms that seem to be benign, that seem to be value neutral. Looking at it today, the doctrine is really the doctrine of Christian supremacy. It is the doctrine of Christian supremacy and invasion, the doctrine of Christian supremacy and expropriation, the doctrine of Christian supremacy and destruction, the doctrine of Christian supremacy and dehumanization, the doctrine of Christian supremacy and domination. What destructive arrogance we have had as the church. The church debated whether indigenous peoples were human or not, and did they have a soul? European empires and Christianity itself were at the time and still are very young groups compared to native cultures and civilizations of the Americas who have dwelled here over 13,000 years. What arrogance was there in saying that Christian Europe alone hears the voice of God? The voice of God, which we know cannot be caged, which goes where it will. In Psalm 104, it says, you make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. And we read in the Psalms, whither shall I go from your spirit? The church had really lost its way, not recognizing there is no place on earth where the voice of God can be silenced, that we are not the only ones to carry the word of God, and often we get it wrong. And I wanna to say today that we need to recapture the values of the early church to truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. We need to examine and eradicate our tendencies toward partiality, toward dominance in the church for the sake of the world. We, the church, need to once and for all divorce empire. Oh yes, we have taken steps in the past. Now oh, the Methodists had their social gospel and were out in the pubs preaching to the poor. The civil rights movement and liberation theology took us a step further in the 20th century, but now we must decolonize the church completely. We must be suspicious of any theology or action that aligns us with dominance, wealth, destruction. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we evaluate all our efforts? Can we evaluate our worship, our mission, our social times, our educational programs against the ethic of the early church to show no preference for the things of this age? 
Can we root out in our church signs and actions that show our preference for wealth and status, class, race, dominance, accumulation? And can we then align the church with those of any faith, tradition, or culture who live out the gospel values of holding no preference? If we can, my friends, we will be a church that with Christ as its head can say, the spirit of the Lord is upon us. The spirit has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. The spirit has sent us to proclaim release, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. The spirit of the Lord has sent us to proclaim the year of divine favor. May it be so. Amen. Generous God, it is through your mercy that we have this ministry, the ministry of our talents and treasure, the ministry of our passion and purpose. Strengthen our hearts for your service and accept the grateful offerings we lay before you. Amen. Now let us pray. O oh God, your heavens tell your glory, and the firmament proclaims your handiwork. Your voice through creation goes out through all the earth, and those who have ears listen. We are grateful that you continue to speak to us day in and day out, to speak to the world your word of grace your word of love, your word of healing. And we ask that your grace and love and healing and forgiveness fall upon all those gathered here today, all those in the church, all those across this state and around the world, all those who seek love and grace and forgiveness and those who even don't know they need it. May your healing touch come to those in need of healing. All those who suffer, may their cries be heard by you. May your loving arms surround them. And when we are weak, may you make us strong to carry out the work of the gospel, to stand up for love, compassion, and justice in this world as followers of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, my friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.